Hi everyone. Today I'm going to present some of our work that has used online learning to design adaptive robotic systems. Well, in some sense, online learning is the focus. This talk is really about thinking carefully about how to combine structure and prior information from simulation, modeling, and expert demonstrations with machine learning and data. I want to start by stepping back and considering how we might want to go about designing intelligent robots. I believe there are at least three completely different ways of thinking about this problem. On the left here, what I've labeled as models, is basically automation. So this is classical robotics. It includes modeling, simulation, mechanics, and controls. It relies heavily on prior knowledge of the system, as well as task environment engineering. These methods are very efficient in terms of compute, but brittle in the face of changing properties of the robot or the environment. On the right, we have a totally different strategy, machine learning. More specifically in the context of this talk, I mean model-free reinforcement learning. The idea here is that we can learn how to behave directly through a robot's interaction with its environment. This works very well for generating behavior where it is not easy to write down a model a priori. Unfortunately, this can also be really expensive in terms of data and compute compared with the model-based approaches or automation. Finally, at the top of the triangle is an important area of robotics that I think is often overlooked by those of us focused on AI research, and this is teleoperated robots. Many successful robotic systems, like the da Vinci surgical robot, have extremely capable hardware but rely on human expertise for decision making. So in summary, these are different ways of approaching robotic intelligence, using models, planning and control, or machine learning, or designing capable teleoperated systems. And they're often viewed as being at odds with each other, but to me, all of the interesting questions are where these areas might intersect. And we're already familiar with some of these intersections, such as adaptive control, imitation learning, and human-in-the-loop models. Today, I really want to focus on three different approaches to designing robot behavior and how they can be related through online learning. We'll talk about model predictive control, reinforcement learning, and imitation learning. And along the way, we'll discuss how reasoning and prior knowledge can be combined with data for designing more effective robotic systems. But first, I want to talk about online learning, which is a sub-area of machine learning, and why it may make sense to think about robotics problems as online learning problems. So let's start by thinking abstractly about what a robot is. So here is a robot. Usually we can assume that the robot can perceive the environment and take an action which changes its relation to the environment. So this is the basic robotics paradigm. But for robots that adapt their behavior with experience, we need to break this down further. So we usually call the function that takes states or observations as input and produces actions as output a policy. And the policy itself has parameters, the theta here. Now if the parameters stay the same, then the robot's behavior stays the same. But we may want robots which can learn from their mistakes and handle complex dynamic environments. In this case, we can specify a learner that updates the policy parameters to improve at some task with experience. The task objective function tells us how good the policy is and guides the learner. Okay, so this is one way of thinking about adaptive robotic system where we've really highlighted the robot's relationship to the environment. But alternatively, we can focus on the learner. So here the learner is interacting with a complex system consisting of the robot in its environment. And we can think of this setup as online learning. So at every round, so in round K, the learner will play some decision, which is a set of parameters for the policy, which we'll call theta K. Uh, so at each time step or at each round, the learner is selecting a policy. We can think of the adversary as selecting a loss function, and then the learner is going to update its decision based on that loss in order to try to improve at some task um, to the theta K plus one. So this is the basic online learning idea. Now, why does this framework make sense for robotics? Well, let's step back and think carefully about how robots should learn and how we often frame machine learning problems um, in practice. So first of all, empirical risk minimization is a dominant paradigm for thinking about machine learning algorithms. It's often used to guide how we think about basic machine learning problems like classification and regression, but in my opinion, it doesn't really make sense for robotics. So first, robotics data is not IID. 
Robots collect data that evolves over time, and they interact in closed loop with their environment. So the data is not independent, and the training distribution does not equal the test distribution. Second, analysis like statistical consistency doesn't really make any sense. So generally, the models that we try to learn in robotics are necessarily approximate. The data generating process typically does not live in the model class that we're trying to fit. And finally, most of the time in robotics, our data is not batched, but it's streaming and collected through a robot's interaction with the environment. So unlike empirical risk minimization, online learning makes minimal assumptions. It's mainly focused on the concept of regret minimization. For stationary policies, we want to learn a policy that works everywhere in the environment. Minimizing regret means learning a sequence of policies that compares well with the best policy in my policy class in hindsight. So in other words, I want to learn rapidly, I want to do the best that I can given my policy class and the data that I have seen so far. For non-stationary policies, what I want to do is I want to learn a policy sequence that is performing as well as possible with respect to the best sequence of policies that I could have executed. This notion of regret is much harder to minimize. So online learning focuses on notions of regret like these. But online learning is also very general in that it does not make an IID assumption. And online learning is agnostic with respect to the ideal system. I'm just trying to learn the best policy in my policy class. So just to summarize, online learning is a perspective. It's a way of unifying algorithms, some of which we may be familiar with, explaining their empirical performance, uh, particularly in robotics tasks, which is what we're really focused on here. Um, and online learning also through this perspective suggests new approaches and new ways of building algorithms which might work well in practice. Okay, so let's see how we can use online learning to solve awesome robotics problems. So to motivate the talk, here's one of our robots. It's a high-speed off-road ground vehicle built in collaboration with several labs in computing and aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech. And our goal is to autonomously race this vehicle faster than a human can pilot it on dirt tracks. So let me tell you a little bit more about this uh, platform before um, continuing. So basically, it's a one-fifth scale truck. You can think about it as a vehicle which is about a meter long. Uh, it weighs about 45 pounds. And it's equipped with electric motors, which give it a top speed of somewhere in the 50 to 60 mile an hour range. It has a whole sensor suite on board. So there are cameras, IMU, GPS, and wheel speed sensors. And it also has considerable computational resources. An i7 processor and a GPU are available on board the platform. And this allows the robot to be able to do all of its computation and make all of its decisions on board. We can control the car by steering and modulating speed with throttle commands. OK, so we have the hardware for this intelligent um, off-road vehicle. And now the main question is, how do we design a policy that will control this vehicle at high speeds over rough terrain and do so without, question, without crashing? So why is this hard? Um, let me just show you a, a slow motion video of the dynamics of our car as it's taking a turn at high speed. So what you can see here is that the car is bouncing and sliding. It's exhibiting behavior which is hard to predict and virtually impossible to simulate accurately from first principles. So how do we control a car where it's very difficult to make really accurate predictions? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to think about the problem of generating a policy to control the vehicle as an online learning problem, where the learner is tasked with choosing a good sequence of policy parameters. Uh, and we'll see what this means. But these policies will then be evaluated by the robot and its interaction with the world. So we'll propose a policy, we'll see how well it works, and then we'll update the policy. And we'll keep doing this at each time step. So this brings us to really the first part of the talk, which is um, thinking about model predictive control and how it relates to online learning. Um, over the course of the talk, we'll try to solve the problem of controlling the vehicle several ways, uh, but we'll start with MPC. So how do we design a policy for a high-speed ground vehicle? Well, despite what my machine learning colleagues may tell you, classical engineering is actually a really good starting point. So we're going to start by decomposing the problem into individual unit-tested components. 
In our current setup, the pipeline uh, looks like this. You can see the diagram in the bottom half of the slide here. So we have sensor data. Um, so our perception consists of differential GPS and IMU, which gives us accurate outdoor position information to within a few centimeters. We do state estimation on board the vehicle. Uh, so we have a map computed from a GPS survey of the environment, and we localize the vehicle relative to that map. We also assume an approximate system model, and then we use model predictive control in order to generate actions. So let me tell you about how this works. So we can think of model predictive control as a pragmatic approach to designing a policy. So instead of attempting to build a single complicated policy, which will work ev well everywhere in our environment, instead we're going to use a very simple policy class and then re-optimize it aggressively at every state that we encounter. Now the interesting thing is that we can actually view model predictive control or MPC as online learning. So let me show you how we think about this. So on the left we have the online learning paradigm and on the right we're going to specify choices for our problem. So first each round of online learning will correspond to a time step in our system. That is, the learner will pick a new policy at every time step. Second, the policy will just be a simple open loop control distribution. Think about this as a distribution of trajectories of actions. Now, note that this policy is not conditioned on state. It's literally just a distribution of action sequences. Now, given a model of the dynamics, we can run the open loop controls and simulate state, a state action distribution. The objective here is then the expected cost under the simulated state action distribution starting from the current state, ST. So in our application, the instantaneous costs include terms like um, stay near the center of the, of the track, drive as fast as possible, and try to minimize acceleration. So the costs are encouraging these behaviors. The way to think about this from an online learning perspective is that by generating a state, the environment can be viewed as picking out where we evaluate our objective in simulation. Like it's placing our control distribution at a particular state. We then forward simulate to generate the expected cost. So in other words, the environment selects the loss function on which we evaluate our policy. Okay, from the online learning perspective, we next want to update the parameters of our policy based on the loss. Our goal is to minimize dynamic regret, although it's difficult to prove anything about this in our domain. To accomplish this, we're going to use an algorithm called dynamic mirror descent, which has two steps. In the first step, it performs mirror descent to update the control distribution so that it has lower loss on the objective. That is, so that it performs better in simulation. Mirror Descent builds a convex global upper bound approximation of the objective using gradient G, step size lambda, and a Bregman divergence. So Bregman divergences, it's a whole class of different divergences, but examples include squared distances or the KL divergence. It then minimizes this surrogate objective function. The result is an updated control distribution that performs better in the simulator for the current state, ST. We then execute the first action from the updated control distribution. And the second step of dynamic mirror descent is the dynamic part, which uses a predictive model to shift the distribution forward from time step t to time step t plus 1. This is kind of like a state space model in a Coleman filter. The online learning algorithm then moves to the next round, which uses the open loop control distribution together with the next state, evaluates the objective, and then updates again with dynamic mirror descent. So this is the overall process and how we can think of MPC as an online learning algorithm. So we call this dynamic mirror descent perspective on MPC, DMD MPC. And the idea is that this online learning framework actually provides a really clean way of thinking about and deriving MPC algorithms. And many MPC algorithms can be viewed as special cases of the approach I discussed in the previous slide. In each case, we can choose a policy, pick an objective, and optimize with dynamic mirror descent. Examples include LQR, cross-entropy method, and model predictive path integral control. 
If you look at the details, this perspective suggests that many off-the-shelf MPC algorithms are actually suboptimal and make a number of heuristic choices that are unjustified in the broader perspective. Example is step size, which is hidden in the stochastic MPC derivations, but is an important component to getting optimization to actually work well. This perspective also provides a prescriptive approach to MPC design. We can easily generate new algorithms that make sense for a particular application. Uh, and some of these um, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide here, uh, where you can just sort of uh, derive new MPC algorithms based on a good choice of a policy, a per-round loss, a divergence, step size, etc. So for the racing task that I talked about several slides ago, we're going to use variations on MPPI. We're going to relax the distributional assumptions, tune the step size, um, and do some things like this in order to actually get it to work better. And all of this will be legal within the dynamic mirror descent framework. So here you can see model predictive path integral control, which is an instance of our approach. We computed the expected cost at each state through sampling. Now this is a GPU accelerated method. Um, it generates almost 2,000 trajectories at about 60 hertz and uses this to evaluate the cost and generate a gradient that dynamic mirror descent can update the policy at each iteration. Now using insights from dynamic mirror descent MPC, we're able to generate new algorithms that can reduce the number of samples needed for the task by almost two orders of magnitude. And this allows us to use much less compute and also scale MPC up to higher dimensional problems. I mean, again, we're able to do this by stepping back and looking at some of these MPC algorithms through this online learning perspective. So I just want to summarize by posting several um, recent papers from our group where we've looked at online learning, mirror descent, and model predictive control. So if you're interested in learning more, um, these papers are a reasonably good starting point. Okay, next I want to talk about reinforcement learning. So let's shift gears some and look at a slightly different problem. So we're going to use the same platform and the same task but here we're going to be interested in end-to-end -end visual navigation. That is mapping images from the camera and noisy wheel speed sensors directly to steering angle and throttle commands. The AI problem is finding a stationary policy that will control the car at high speeds over rough terrain without crashing. So here we'll parameterize the policy as a deep neural network and we'll have to train the network in the system somehow. So in its essence this is a reinforcement learning problem. The goal is to find a policy parameterized by theta that maps states or maybe observations directly to actions. The objective seeks to find an optimal set of parameters theta that minimizes accumulated cost. Now note that the expectation is taken with respect to the distribution of states and actions induced by the policy that we want to learn. The cost terms here are instantaneous cost, which in our case say that driving slowly is bad, crashing is bad, and lots of actuation is bad. Now interestingly, we can also view training the deep neural network via RL as an online learning problem. Every round or iteration is an episode. In other words, we make a decision, that is, we choose a policy, then run the policy in the system for some amount of time. This allows us to evaluate how good the policy is before we update it. So here the policy is a deep neural network. Um, it's stationary, so we'll use the same policy everywhere in our state space. The per round loss is going to then be the accumulated cost that the policy incurs over this whole episode. Our goal will then be to minimize static regret. That is, we want to converge quickly to the best policy in our policy class. This is hard to minimize since the per round loss is typically non-convex. However, we'll do our best and we'll again use uh, mirror descent in order to do this. Now this online learning approach using mirror descent actually defines an entire family of policy gradient algorithms, many of which you may be familiar with. So different choices of Bregman divergence result in different algorithms. And this is super interesting because all of these popular algorithms can actually be classified by how they differ in the regularization term of mirror descent. Okay, so at this point, I just want to sort of step back and think about, does reinforcement learning actually make sense as a good strategy for trying to learn 
a deep neural network policy which does something like map images to actions. Well, despite their popularity in reinforcement learning, policy gradient approaches like the ones which I summarized in a previous slide do have clear limitations. So they're generally subject to noisy and biased gradients due to the challenge of estimating the objective function well. And their updates are myopic, so they're taking small steps to a local fixed point in the optimization landscape. At the end of the day, these issues mean that reinforcement learning agents require a very large number of interactions in the environment in order to succeed. Now this can actually work for games and simulated tasks, and we've seen an explosion of deep RL papers that use these sorts of environments for evaluation. But with real systems, training is significantly more difficult and data is much harder to come by. So we can't run the robot faster than real time and costs which are incurred while interacting with the environment are very real. So we want to avoid mistakes as much as possible and try to make it so that the car, uh, in our case, um, doesn't crash and damage itself. So this brings us to imitation learning as a way of overcoming some of the problems with reinforcement learning. So basically we can think of imitation learning as a way to accelerate policy learning by leveraging prior information. And this prior knowledge can come in many forms, but we'll assume that it's encoded as an expert policy. The main insight here is that expert policies will help us to define surrogate loss functions that are easier to optimize. So let's take a look at how the, this actually works. So essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the performance of the policy that we want to optimize to an expert policy and try to minimize the performance difference. So in practice, we can upper bound the performance difference with a statistical difference. And different divergences lead to different well-known imitation learning algorithms. If we move the evaluation of the expert policy to the right-hand side of the inequality, like so, then we see that we can basically upper bound our objective. Minimizing this upper bound, we see that the first term is constant, so we can remove it, and this results in the following objective. However, minimizing this objective is still an RL problem. We can interpret this as basically just to have changed the cost function, or changed the MDP that we're trying to um, solve. So it may be easier than the original problem, but it can be just as hard to optimize from a theoretical perspective. But with a small change, we can actually make this a convex function. And the key here is to change the distribution. So here we're fixing it to the distribution of the current policy. The loss can now easily be convex, like the L1 or L2 distance between the policy and expert actions. So going back to our online learning perspective, the per round loss is convex with respect to the expert policy. And keeping everything else in the problem the same, we can get significantly better performance compared with RL. So just as in MPC and reinforcement learning, mirror descent defines a whole family of imitation learning algorithms. So different losses result in different algorithms. Using differences in actions results in dagger. Using differences in advantage results in aggravated. And by choosing different divergences, this results in different variations. So for example, we can define new algorithms like a TRPO version of aggravated. So now we have a way of overcoming some of the limitations of reinforcement learning. Instead of noisy bias gradients, we can optimize these surrogate problems with more informative gradients. And instead of very sort of small myopic updates to our policy, we can use a loss constructed around an expert which allows for on average improvement towards a global optima. We can take bigger steps um, toward getting there. So just in summary, the main insight is that expert policies can define surrogate loss functions that are easier to optimize. Okay, so let's return to the problem of optimizing a deep neural network policy to use vision in order to control our high-speed off-road robot. So here we have the learner. We want to train a deep neural network that maps camera images and wheel speeds to steering and throttle commands. For the expert, we're going to use the MPC algorithm from the first part of the talk that relies on GPS and IMU in order to estimate the state and aggressively updates its simple control distribution. This approach relies on a $12,000 sensor suite, so if we can get a neural network to drive the same way with maybe just a $500 camera, that would be pretty cool. The last part of the system is the safety controller, and I won't really talk about the details of that here. So let's look at some results. 
Uh, so here you're actually seeing the car being piloted by the deep neural network that we've learned using imitation learning. Uh, we learned it by imitating the MPC expert. And as you'll see, it's uh, robust to variations in lighting and minor visual distractions like um, some mud or uh, water which gets in the lens of the camera. So the thing to note here is that our learned policy is uh, completing laps in almost exactly the same time as our MPC expert. And again, it was able to learn the deep neural network in order to do this uh, by imitating the expert. Okay. Um, so if you want to learn more about uh, our work in imitation learning, um, here are just a few of the papers uh, that, that you can start to take a look at if, if anyone is interested. All right, so let me just summarize um, the talk. So basically, uh, here are a few of the points that I, I really wanted to um, make sure that you all get as takeaways. So first of all, online learning is a very useful perspective that can, serve, that can serve as a unifying framework um, for understanding problems like model predictive control, reinforcement learning, and imitation learning. It uh, provides simple derivations and allows us to use insights from optimization in order to um, suggest new and better algorithms. Model predictive control is a very effective approach to handling challenges like complex and dynamic environments uh, with very simple models. And the takeaway here is that this local optimization or online optimization of simple policies um, is very, very effective. And uh, as you can see, it works very well on fairly difficult robotics problems. Reinforcement learning uh, can learn complex policies and solve extremely difficult problems. Uh, it's state of the art in games, perception, and language. Uh, and we should pay attention to it, right? So data is revolutionizing how we attack fundamental problems in robotics. Uh, but the key is understanding how to generate and leverage this data. And this is something that is sometimes not easy for us to do. Uh, again, data can be very expensive and we may not be able to collect a lot of it uh, in order to um, get a robot to try to complete a task. Finally, imitation learning is a very general way to accelerate policy learning. It provides a way to leverage models and simulators, um, things like MPC and um, other types of strategies uh, to learn policies more effectively. So the takeaway is that we can leverage these surrogate objective functions that are easier to optimize and we can use other types of approaches to help us to learn policies faster. Finally, I want to thank uh, the awesome interdisciplinary team of robotics PhD students in computing, aerospace engineering, and electrical engineering at the University of Washington and Georgia Tech, who have all been working together to produce the work you saw today. Also, Wen Sun, who is now a professor at Cornell, who has been collaborating with us on imitation learning. All right, thank you.